All right, Crystal, what's on your radar? Well, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris sat down with civil rights leaders this week in a virtual meeting that up to this point had only been described by participants. However, the one and only Ryan Graham managed to get his hands on the complete audio, and folks, there is a lot there. I got a few clips to play for you today, but you definitely want to subscribe to Ryan's podcast, Deconstructed, to hear a lot more, and trust me, you're going to want to hear a lot more. Now, the first thing you notice in this audio is that many of these leaders, not particularly happy with Biden so far, is particular upset at the selection of Tom Vilsack for ag commissioner. You will recall that Vilsack was the one who fired Shirley Sherrod in a deeply shameful incident after Ms. Sherrod was unfairly smeared by Breitbart. They were also disgusted by the idea that Rahm Emanuel would even be considered for anything after his role in covering up the killing of Laquan McDonald. And they seem generally to feel like they weren't getting a lot of specifics in terms of an action plan from Biden on the issues that they cared about the most. Now, over the course of the meeting, Biden directly admits that he doesn't even want to talk about police reform until after Georgia and outright blames defund the police for Democrats underperformance. He shows himself to be characteristically thin skinned when challenged at all, something, of course, we've seen before. The perniciousness of hollow identity politics also on full display with Biden in one really bizarre moment lecturing these leaders, quote, you guys are going to have to start working more with Hispanics who make up a larger portion of the population than y'all do in terms of raw numbers. Always awesome to have some weird zero sum competition between demographic groups. And he repeatedly shows complete contempt for progressives, referring derisively to AOC's ability to get things done in Congress. But there were three incredibly revealing pieces of information communicated in this call that literally tell you everything you need to know about how the Biden administration is actually going to go. Put together, they are a true bombshell. And honestly, the landscape that we are facing is even worse than I thought. So first of all, Biden repeatedly and aggressively comments about how much his words alone matter. It's probably the most consistent through line of all of his comments. Just listen to how Biden responds to a questioner's specific concern about a lack of action and progress. A lot of people in our community are getting a little anxious because they are not seeing enough of the progress they thought they would have seen at this point. Let's not disappoint them and let's not get to a place where voters in Georgia begin to second guess. Okay, let me respond. I, I, I've, got to, I've got to go. Let me respond. There's a lot to respond to here. Let's get something straight. You shouldn't be disappointed. What I've done so far is more than anybody else has done this far. Okay, number one. Number two, I mean what I say when I say it. I mean what I say when I say it. I'm the only person who's ever run on three platforms that I was told could not possibly win the election. And I never ceased from it. One was on restoring the soul of this country because of what I saw happen in Charlottesville. That was it. No one else was talking about it. The words of presidents matter. Nobody else, no progressive, was talking about it. I did. So he's asked about progress and he says, hey, I talked about Charlottesville. Isn't that enough for you people? I mean, in fairness, it is more or less all that he promised on the campaign trail, but you can't really blame people for wanting a little bit more now that Biden is ascending to the heights of American power. Words matter, sure, but actions matter more. Biden, throughout this call, seems not to agree. All right, the second important piece is this. Biden acknowledges that it's going to be extremely tough to get anything passed through Congress, basically throwing up his hands and setting expectations at the ground for what he can actually do. Here he is talking specifically about two voting rights bills. I like H.R. 1 and I like H.R. 4. But let me tell you something. We're going to have a hell of a hard time getting that passed through a Republican Senate. So the question is, what can we do in the meantime? I'm going to push him. Hell of a hard time. And he's not wrong, of course. Republicans are not going to do a damn thing with him unless it's something you really don't want them to do in the first place. Start a new war, cut Social Security and the like. So you might think that given his acknowledgement of how challenging the congressional landscape is likely to be, that Biden would be ready to get creative in order to deliver some results. Yeah, not so much. And this is the third and absolutely critical piece. Biden goes out of his way to pour cold water on the idea of doing much more than rolling back Trump era executive orders using his own new powers. And so there's some things that I'm going to be able to do by executive order. I'm not going to hesitate to do it. But what I'm not going to do 
is I'm not going to do what used to, Benita, you probably used to get angry with me during the debates when you'd have some of the people you were supporting that uh, on day one, I'm going to executive order to do this. Not within the constitutional authority. I am not going to violate the Constitution. Executive authority that my progressive friends talk about is way beyond the bounds. And as a, a, one of you said, maybe you were at Reverend now, well, whether it's far left or far right, there is a Constitution. It's our only hope, our only hope. And the way to deal with it is where I have executive authority, I will use it to undo every single damn thing this guy has done by executive authority. But I'm not going to ex exercise executive authority where it's questioned, where I can come along and say I can do away with assault weapons. There's no executive authority to do away with that. So you can all put your arguments about the class dynamics of canceling student debt back in the drawer because this guy, he's not planning on doing anything, let alone something as big as that. He's not even going to try and once again punches left the progressives who dared to suggest he might actually have the power to get something done. So with those words and more importantly, with those intentions, Joe Biden has essentially just flushed his presidency down the toilet and the country right along with it. He knows he's not going to get anything from Congress. He has no intention of fighting through executive action and is apparently operating under the delusion that we should all view him as some kind of hero for just saying the words racism in Charlottesville enough times. Well, at least he's committed to giving Mayor Pete the right springboard for his political ambitions. I can't possibly overstate how important Biden's attitude towards executive action really is. It means substantively that we're going to have complete gridlock and next to zero progress. And a lack of progress while the bottom is falling out doesn't mean you stay in the same place. It means collapse. It means destruction. That lack of progress politically means that Democrats are going to get absolutely destroyed in the midterm elections as a nation rightfully enraged by how they've been left down to dry seeks revenge on those at the top. And it means that the populist rage which brought us Trump and Bernie is only going to grow in strength and import. When FDR surveyed the utter devastation from the Great Depression, he wrote that, quote, it is time for the country to become fairly radical for a generation. Joe Biden has surveyed the destruction wrought by not only a depression, but a pandemic and mass social unrest and decided that now was the time to hew to the right, not to rock the boat and hope that empty rhetoric alone will suffice. Unless he has a dramatic come to Jesus moment and rethinks this foolhardy approach, there will be hell to pay. There is nothing but extreme danger and pain in this safe course that he has chosen. And Sagar, this is it. Like, he's unlikely to have the Senate, even if they win both seats in Georgia. Then you're negotiating with, like, Joe Manchin and Christian Cinema. So yeah. it's like a barely improved situation. But even in that situation, and he's not willing to do what he can with executive action and push the boundaries and, you know, let the courts decide whether it's appropriate or not. That means his entire presidency is going to be operate like not even incrementalism, like less than incrementalism. Whatever failures of the Obama administration, lack of ability to get anything done, this is going to be far, far worse. Well, that's the real question, which is that how is it all going to work? And I've always actually been skeptical of executive action because it's just too challengeable in court and reversible. I mean, so much of the defense of Trump from a lot of people on the right were like, but he did all of these things. And I'm like, yeah, but now it's just going to be undone. So like, what? We got like 220 miles of replacement border wall. And like that's about it, right? Yeah. Whenever it comes from executive action, the deal is all in Congress. So in a way, I agree with him, but I don't think he has what it takes in order to get anything done in Congress. Well, he's waving the white and flag on that too. Yeah, I mean, he's like, I'm not, I can't really get anything through through Congress. I'm not really going to do anything through executive actions. Like, what are you there for? And he gives you that answer, too, which yeah. is uh, my words alone matter. And that should be enough. My question is, is if he will adjust course like Obama did later in his administration. But I just still think going all in on executive action is foolish. And he has to try and do something innovative in Congress if he wants to do anything. And I, the other thing which always shocks me is his like hectoring, lecturing, lecturing attitude. Ugh. It's, you know, one so thing, you know, having met some of the these presidents, they are so, their egos are so big. Mm -hmm. The way, I mean, that's exactly how Obama used to talk to everybody, right? When they go off the record, he'd be like, you don't understand. You know, all of it was built in like, I got elected. Who the hell are you? And 
that's true. But, you know, <laughs> like you should probably listen to some people. And just the way, it's like you said, Charlottesville. Mike, and what did he say? He said nobody in the progressives were talking about Charlottesville. Like, what, what are you talking about? I know. About? I Do you know. think you're the only guy to talk about Charlottesville? Like, wow, that's so American brave politics? that you that you're opposed Congrats. to racism. I mean, I, I you know, know, just saying the thing. And that was the thing is he yeah. really took umbrage at yeah. the idea that him just like saying the right thing yeah. wasn't enough. That they actually wanted to see tangible progress and were pushing for very specific executive action. And he's like, eh, I'm probably not going to really do that. But, you know, I am going to say the words that you want to hear. So that should ultimately I be enough. I am curious what, kind of what they meant. And I should go listen to the entire thing. I mean, yeah. he's not wrong on defund the police whenever he's like, yeah, I think defund the police is how they beat the hell, living hell out of us across the country. And I'm not going to lean into anything I mean, that would do that. That's very. That's true. It's very. Yeah. Look, you know I yeah. agree yeah. that defund the police yeah. is not a helpful political slogan. But it's also extraordinarily convenient to just pawn off all of the Democratic failures totally. on the left when they've been failing for decades and to pawn it all off on defund the police when they've been failing and losing ground in these places for decades. So, And specifically under Barack Obama. So I find that a little bit convenient. But it's also like... It's kind of blatant and a little bit too candid to be like, look, we want to do police reform, mm -hmm. but let's not say a word about it until we get past Georgia, which I'm sure the right is going to seize on as like, oh, they have a secret agenda, which, I mean, well, he kind of admits is kind of true. That is politically correct, I think. I mean, I wouldn't know that, especially in a tight race in Georgia, especially with, with Kelly Loeffler and their strategy, is, which I think is probably going to work. So I think that is a correct instinct. But overall, you can see that if you're going to have a blank slate kind of presidency where it's all just going to be rhetoric that's not going to do anything and that that is the problem and as you're pointing to which is that if you're not willing to do something big or try because i think that's the other thing america will forgive you if you try mm -hmm. and you don't get something done but they will not forget not trying yes and that is the thing where i think he has a tremendous political liability where obviously someone can come in from the right and say hey i'm actually going to try to do something big i mean that's ostensibly what Trump did in 2016, but also it gives you, I mean, he has a total lock on the party, right? And he's essentially writing what the agenda is going to be. I think that's the biggest problem that he has. I uh, yeah. think that, you know, in the build up to this election, Trump in his like executive orders to try to get people yeah. a little more unemployment, or whatever, I think people gave him a lot more credit for that than I thought that they Same. would. Wow, because thanks. he was the only person who was out there that even appeared to be trying to do anything. Yeah. And so, you know, I disagree about executive action. There's no way that anything's going to get through Congress. This is the only opportunity to get things done and screw the norms and the guardrails. Go out there, be aggressive, do what you can. And if the court rolls it back, then deal with it as it comes. But for example, like if you extend health care to people and then the court rolls that back, there's going to be a real public reckoning. And maybe then you do force ultimately congressional action. I just don't think he has any other cards to play. And the fact that he's unwilling to play even the the small hand that he has is incredibly illustrative and incredibly telling about how all of this is likely to unfold. It's possible. I mean, always what your problem, though, is you have the risk of the backlash and of just rolling back whatever you tried. And so that's kind of what I see with backlash Trump. Backlash to people getting health care? No, I mean, not, as long as is only one. Student, right. uh, student debt actually could cause a huge political crisis. I mean, as you could go and you could think about so many, I don't know what else he wants to do. I mean, Trump did a moratorium exactly. on student debt payments as yeah. well. And oh, there well, that was the payments. He didn't cancel it. And so yeah, I'm, but there I'm was no like, backlash to that. I mean, look, it depends, yeah, obviously, yeah. on what the executive order is. But you, if you're yeah. actually doing things that people say, okay, I see you trying, and I see that this is having some moderate impact on my life, you get a political benefit, and if the courts roll it back, then you deal with it as it comes. Yeah, yeah we'll see. All right, Sagar, looking forward to your radar. That's next.